This morning, if you don't have a sermon outline, please lift your hand and let these gentlemen help you with that. You will definitely need one this morning as we come to the Word of God. Take your Bible and turn with me to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, and uh, I'm going to show you a picture of one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, does anybody happen to know what city this is in Europe? This is in Geneva. Geneva, Switzerland, has one of the tallest water towers in the world. That is a tower that shoots over 200 feet, 20 stories into the air, the, the fountain that is there. But Geneva, Switzerland, is a modern city that has many ancient um, and wonderful places in it. And one of those is St. Peter's Basilica, where John Calvin taught and preached the gospel for over 40 years. It was there in that place that much of the Reformation gained steam and moved forward. Um, in fact, um, in the community that's right there around the corner from St. Peter's is a wall. And just, just kind of notice this wall that's there. I want you to see these statues of reformers that are there, Biza, and Farrell and Calvin and Knox were just four of the many reformers. But I want you to see how large this wall is. It is glorious. It's a beautiful place and a monument to those who had helped reclaim the gospel. During the Reformation celebration of our church, we do not exalt the men and the women of the Reformation any more uh, then we should simply rejoicing in the fact that God used men and women to bring to us again the clear gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God that the church is so desperate for. So the Reformation, though it really got going about 500 years ago, we find ourselves in need of what we call an ongoing Reformation. Semper reformata. Notice this, always reforming. That's what that means. And so this morning I want to ask you to help me out by going ahead and filling that in at the top of the out outline there, always reforming. Over the last five years, we've studied the Reformation each October. A fair amount of the core of the church has learned quite a bit of the Reformation history, and that's been helpful. This morning I want us to not only remember the great reformational truths that were recovered in the gospel in light of the Reformation, but especially toward the end of this message, in just a few moments, we're going to see how it, it applies to us even now in very powerful ways that the church must always be reforming in itself back to Christ. The church must always be reforming. Notice with me Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, 18 through 23. And he, that is Christ, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Very important verse is verse 19. Who was Jesus? Jesus was God. Look with me in verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Verse 21. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. In, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister." Here is the Apostle Paul helping the Colossian church to not look to other things for their salvation, but to look solely and only at the person of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, reconciling the world to himself. And he is saying here that we must be careful to remember who the Savior is and what he has done. 
in all who have received him, all who have been made his children will continue in that faith. This morning, I want us to see some key Reformation realities from Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 through 23. And so, I want you to see, first of all, that Christ is the only head of the church. Christ is the only head of the church. Look in verse 18 in the box on the top of the page. And he, and I've put the brackets there, Christ, to make it very clear, and he is the head of the body, the church. If you were, would, notice the verse and notice these words that indicate this. Number one, he's the head. Look at the screen, if you would, and notice that he is the beginning. He is the beginning, and not only the beginning, he's the firstborn from the dead. And why are all these things true? Because he is is the preeminent one. Eminent means surpassing. And so if you're the preeminent one, that means that you're the surpassing, surpassing. You are the one who cannot be surpassed. And so in verse 18, we see that Jesus is the head of the church. And why is he the head? I want you to notice that as we look at this word, the head of the body, where does this come from? Here's part of the idea. The body serves the head. And so the church serves, the body of Christ serves the head of the church who is the savior of the world. And notice this, the body serves the head, and yet the head sustains the body. Um, I love Colossians chapter 2 in verse 19, and I have it on the screen in front of you. The head from whom the whole body is supported and knit together by its joints and its ligaments grows as God causes it to grow. Do you see that? You see, the, the head is very important. In fact, we, we um, have never met anybody who doesn't. I've met people who don't have a leg. I've met people who don't have an arm. I've met people who have missed some part of their body. There's people who... Their, their liver has failed, and, and their kidneys have failed, and somebody took out a lung, and some things like that. But I've never met somebody that doesn't have a head. And this Colossians passage is very interesting. You know, when the Bible does mention science, it is always true. But here, the picture is, is that as, as we see in Colossians, the head of the church, or the head of even the human body, the whole body is supported and knit together in this, and the, the, the picture here I want you to see is even in development as it's being knit together. This is an actual picture of a human fetus at just five weeks. Now, one of the most identifiable things in the very, very beginning of a human development, developing fetus is the eye. A little black dot quickly appears. In fact, the eye and the ear become some of the very first parts. So, and look at this picture, and look how huge the head is in compared to the rest of the body. Now, why is that so important? Because there's some important stuff up there that determines much about who you are in the rest of your body. And as the genetic code is being unfolded and multiplied, we see this picture of Colossians 2, 19 coming together, even in our development. Well, when we begin to think about the importance of the head to who you are, we need to think of Christ as being the head of the church. Christ as being the one who sustains us if you think about it, through the head comes oxygen and air. Through the head comes water and nutrients. Through the head comes food and nutrients. You see, the, the body does its part to sustain the rest of the body. Excuse me, the head does its part to sustain the rest of the body. We see this picture of the importance of Christ being the head of the church. And why is this? That in everything, he might be preeminent. Christ surpasses all others. There are no rivals. Fill that in. Christ surpasses all others. There are no rivals to Christ when it comes to the church. The pastor is not to be a rival over the church. The elders of the church should not be a rival for 
the church, with Christ over the leadership of the body of Christ. They are all subservient. Even the congregation is not a means to itself without Christ. Christ is the one who is the head of the church. Number two, I want you to see, and we see it in verses 18 through 20, that Christ is the only source of salvation. Christ is the only source of salvation. You see, verse 18, look what it says, and he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. Now, if you would, underline this phrase, the firstborn from the dead. What in the world does that mean? We're going to look at that. He is the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Look in verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And then in verse 20, we see, for through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You see, this salvation comes through Christ, who is called the firstborn from the dead. Now, this is the picture, and fill this in as well. Because his death and resurrection gives life from death for all who are saved, that is the only source of our salvation. You see, he gives life from death. He is the only one who gives life from death. And why is it that he can do that? Because he is the firstborn from the dead. He has vanquished death. Now, the firstborn from the dead is not so much about chronology, though that's true, but causality. Causality. This is the cause for our life. This is the cause for our resurrection. It is because he was raised. That's what firstborn from the dead is talking about. You see, Christ's resurrection, filled this in, results in our resurrection. In fact, the Apostle Paul would write, if Christ has not been raised, then our faith is in vain. We are to be most pitied among men if Christ be not raised because we are still in our sins. We are still dead in our sins. You see, it is Christ's resurrection that results in our resurrection. But this is very interesting, though, even though the idea is on priority and the importance of this over chronology, even so, if you think about it, Christ is the first to be raised from the dead never to die again. Christ is the first to be raised from the dead never to die again. Some of you would say, well, what about Lazarus? Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But is there any indication in Scripture that Lazarus did not die a second time? No, Lazarus would have died a second time. Now, that's kind of rough on Lazarus. I've thought about that many times. I thought, wow, poor Lazarus had to go through it twice. But I think the second time was probably a lot easier since he had already been to death and raised back, representing all that Christ's power has to offer. I think that he went to death the second time with a bit more peace. Now think about this with me. Christ is the first to be raised, never to die again. And because Christ was raised from the dead, we too rejoice in the salvation that he offers. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. These are the words of the first and the last who died and returned to life. That's what Jesus did. He is the first and the last. He is the preeminent one, and he rose in life. Look at Revelation chapter 22 and verse 13. This is on your outline or on the screen. Look what it says. I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Five times in the book of Revelation, Jesus is described as the first and the last. All of creation begins with him, and it has its final result in him. In the word, we see that in the word, the word spoke, and the word came to be. The world came to be. So in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23 through 28, we see another beautiful picture of how Jesus, just filled this in, Jesus is the final and forever high priest. He is perfect in power and holiness. So this final and forever high priest is the one who comes and saves his people from their sin. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
we talked about in starting point a few moments ago that Sheridan Hills is committed to the truth of the Bible. We're committed to the truth of the Bible even when that truth may not be popular with the world that surrounds us. One of our core values is the word truth. And so when we look at the Scripture and we look at the world, we choose to go with the, what the Scripture says over what the world says. Now, it's a very unpopular thing to suggest in this day and time that, that Christ is the only way to heaven. People would l- often look at us and they think, that is so narrow-minded. You guys are so narrow-minded. Why in the world would you, would you subscribe to something that says that your way is the only way? We would say, it's not our way, it's his way. Jesus is the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I didn't make up the rules. He did. And so what we need to recognize is that he indeed is the one who has declared what is to be and that he has said there is salvation in no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, this is all of what Colossians is talking about. Colossians is talking about the preeminence of Christ. Colossians is talking about not only the superiority of Christ, but the absolute necessity of Christ in his life, his death, and his resurrection. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God, and underline this part, and there is one what? Mediator. Mediator. Circle the word mediator. And there is one mediator between God and men, and you could write above the word God, holy, holy God, and write above the word men, sinful men. So there is one mediator between God and men, and then what is that mediator? The man, Christ Jesus. And so here we see the infinite God-man, God in the flesh, has come to be the mediator between heaven and earth. And it's very interesting to me that um, the, the way in which the Savior of the world uh, was, was put to death was not put to death in a, in a hole in the ground or in the sea or in a lake or in a river or something like that. The way in which Jesus was put to death was lifted up between heaven and earth. If you think about that with me, he's lifted up as if to to draw the bridge between heaven and earth, that God and man are reunited through the sacrifice of Christ for our sins. Now, if you think about number one, what did I say number one is? Did Did you fill out? What's number one? Let's read it out loud together. Christ is the only head of the church. Can we read that out loud? Number one, Christ is the only head of the church. That's what we see in verse 18. When we look at 18 through 20, we see number two. Let's read number two. Christ is the only source of salvation. That is eminently clear. That is eminently clear, not only from Colossians chapter 1, but throughout the Scripture that God's salvation is the salvation that comes from Him. Now, contrast that with the way religiosity can get off the tracks. Look at the contrast. Notice the titles given to people in the Roman, Anglican, and Orthodox Church. His Holiness. My friends, there's only one that is holy. Holy Father is given to men. His beatitude, his eminence. Wow, look at this one, his grace. That is a title in the Anglican church given to um, priests and bishops, his grace. Reverend, I will never forget being standing next to Bill Billingsley when someone called him Reverend Billingsley. And Bill Billingsley was the pastor here when I was a kid, and he said, there is only one Reverend, the Lord Jesus. He said, don't call me Reverend. Notice this, the most Reverend. Well, that certainly would have to be Christ, not a man. How about priest? Jesus is our priest. 
I am not a priest. There's, there's, there's no one who can be the mediator between God and man except the priest of Christ. Vicar means the one who is the substitute. There is only one substitute, Christ. How about when we go over into Mariology? Mariology makes very bold claims. The mother of God, the queen of heaven, the wife of the Holy Spirit. How about this one from Irenaeus in the third century? Cause of our salvation. Can you say that is ridiculous? <laughs> what about the last shoe? For over 300 years, this has been pressed for, and John Paul II in 1991 um, declared this, that Mary was the co-mediatrix with Christ or the co-redemptrix with Christ. My friends, it is very easy for religion, and not just Catholicism or Orthodox or whatever, it can be very easy for Baptist life too to get off the rails and to begin looking to man instead of God. And that is a very dangerous thing to do. Very quickly, look at 1997 Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 882 says this, the Pope has full, supreme, and universal power over the whole church, a power which he can always exercise unhindered. My friends, there is only one who has that kind of power over the church, and it's not the Pope. Look at the Catechism of paragraph 937. The Pope enjoys, by divine institution, supreme, full, immediate, and universal power in what? The care of souls. That's simply not true. There is only one who has universal care over the souls of men, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, all of these, fill this in, all of these are faults in what they infer concerning both the character or the function of people, of men. This leads to idolatry. It leads to false worship and other false beliefs. We need to be very, very careful that we hold on to what the Scripture says and not to what the encyclicals of man say. If you would, flip over your sheet and notice with me last three things I want you to see. When we look at verses 21 through 22, we see this. Look at number three. Christ's sacrificial death on the cross completely heals our relationship with God by wiping out our sins and making us totally acceptable and pleasing to him. And I'll read that again. Look at verse three, or number three. Christ's sacrificial death on the cross, I love it, completely heals. As I was praying and thinking about this, I was thinking about the fact that there's people all over this room that have great wounds with God, that have great wounds not inflicted by God so much as inflicted through our sin coming and raging against God. And very often we look at them and we say, is this from God? Is this from the world? Do you know that the Bible tells us in Psalm 118, or 119, it says in four different places that our wounds will often bring us to God, that we learn to look to God even through the hardships and the troubles of this life. What looks like one of the greatest curses in your life may be one of the greatest blessings in your life as you turn to God in faith. You see, the greatest saving truth is this, is that it is Christ's death on the cross that heals our relationship with God. And how does he do it? He does it by wiping out our sins and making us totally acceptable and pleasing to him. This sounds too good to be true, but look at verse 21 there in your box at the top of the page. In verse 21 it says, and you who, were once, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled. And how did he do it? In his body of flesh by his death 
in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach to the rest of the world. Is that what it says? Pay attention here. This is very important. In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. In fact, the scripture says just opposite is what the world will say. The world, as we turn to Christ and come to God and become his, a fallen world looks and rejects, and in fact, we become the reproach of the world. But when we come to Christ and we see what he has done, he is the one who completely heals our relationship with God. He makes us holy and blameless. This is why Christians can be called saints. And I'm not talking about the saints of the Roman Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church. No, we see throughout the Scripture that those who are in Christ are called the saints. You say, I'm a saint? I keep telling my wife that. But she doesn't believe me. Well, if you're in Christ, listen. That is the picture of what Christ has given us, is that we have the holy and the blameless state not because of any righteousness of our own, but in fact, in spite of our unrighteousness, because of the righteousness of Christ, Christ reconciling us to himself through his death on the cross. This is how God does it. You see, anyone who has been made a saint has not been made a saint at no price. price. He has been made a saint at the greatest price of all. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 and 9. These two verses, the first one is usually very familiar. The second one we often overlook. We shouldn't. Look at verse 8. It says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Look at verse 9. Since, therefore, we have been justified. That means paid for. That means made right. By his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from what? The wrath of God. So verse 9 shows us, fill it in, that this is God saving us from God. You say, isn't it God saving us from our sin? Yes, but the reason that you have a problem as a sinner is that a holy God will condemn you. But here we see, through Christ, there is salvation from God's righteousness. There is salvation from his wrath. And so we see that he comes and he saves us by his own goodness. In 2 Timothy, or excuse me, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, look at the screen in front of you. I want you to see this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That is the picture of what Jeremy Escobar gave to us today in his baptism. The picture of baptism is that when we identify ourselves with Christ, Jeremy is saying, because of Christ, my old life is gone and my new life in Christ is alive. As someone said here a moment ago, living saints. And so I want us to see that this is what God does. He brings us to life in Christ. By his wounds, we are healed. This is God saving us from God. You see, fill it in, it's all Christ. It's every bit Christ. It is not the Pope. It's not the church. It's not Mary. It's not your grandmother. It's not the fiery Baptist preacher. It's not your good works. The hope that we have is all in Christ. It's only Christ. No one and nothing else. Now, this is important because this is what the Reformation was reclaiming. This is what the Reformation was starting to say. Hey, church, we look to Christ, not anything else. You can't buy your way out of your sinful condition. You can't buy an indulgence and God is going to overlook it. You can't go to purgatory and pay for it. Christ is the only one that can pay for your sins and make you holy and blameless before God. And he does so instantaneously. And he does so beautifully and powerfully, and listen, completely when we come to him in faith. You see, notice this and fill this in. Conversion is God's enabling. This is God's enabling. This is God's power of repentance and faith in response to the gospel. 
God, if you, if you have believed upon God, it is because God has divinely enabled you to believe upon him. If you have turned from your sin, we see in Romans chapter two that it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Not only is it God's enabling, but it, it, conversion is radical. It's not just a little bit. The difference is night and day, death and life, old and new. When we see people converted in the scripture, we see that they are radically converted to Christ. I mean, did you, did you see what happens with Zacchaeus? When Zacchaeus comes and has a, an, a confrontation with Jesus, and he discovers the need of his heart, Zacchaeus is radically converted to the truth. Zacchaeus goes and he gives back to all of those that he's stolen from, and in fact, several times over. It is a radical conversion. Have you been radically converted to Christ? You see, conversion is noticeable. If it's, if it's radical, it's going to be noticeable. Jesus said we are going to be known by our fruit. It's, there's going to be evidence of it. And conversion is also, and this passage is, is pointing to this, conversion is permanent. It's not like, well, I used to be a Christian, now I'm, now I'm not. If you're truly a Christian, if you've truly been made a child of God, we begin to see unfold in the Scripture the perseverance of the saints, the perseverance of those who have truly been con converted. Notice the statement next to that. Temporary commitment is not genuine conversion. Now, I've made those four bullet points there, and there's several passages, and these are just a few of them. If, you, if, you're, if you're thinking about those, if you're struggling with any of those, I want to encourage you to go and carefully and prayerfully read through those references. Go and do your own study. Go and start looking. Is it that God gives us the faith to believe? Yes, faith is a gift. Is it that conversion is truly radical? Is it that conversion is noticeable and permanent? I believe so. We see this in this passage, that, that his conversion makes us holy and blameless above reproach. How about this one, number four, and we see this in verse 23, that true Christians will continue to trust in Jesus. They will stay in his gospel. They will not leave his gospel. Look at verse 23 up there in the box on the page. Look at verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. You see, he's saying, circle the word, if, in, or the two words, if indeed. See, if indeed you continue. Now, what does that mean? Let me clarify this for you underneath number four. Continuing in Christ is in no way the means of salvation. Your continuing doesn't save you. Only Christ can save you. Your continuing doesn't add anything to your merit, but it is definitely the proof of your salvation. It's not the means of your salvation, but it is definitely the proof of your salvation. And so we, we see as this unfolds that you once were hostile toward God, but he saved you, and you can know that he saved you if you continue with him. This is important for us to recognize, and this is important for us to consider. Said another way is this, true Christians never get over their salvation. True Christians never get over their salvation. I'm going to tell you that when I was in high school, I met a young guy. When I was in ninth grade, we became very good friends. We spent a lot of time together. In fact, um, he started coming to our house a lot, and he prayed to receive Christ when we were in ninth grade. And he, he really was changed. He really um, was moved by that. And listen to this. He started talking to his mom and dad about faith in Christ. And he was very concerned about his mom and dad and their faith. His mother um, began to, to come to church. His mother began to respond to the gospel. And when he pressed in on his dad and continued to ask his dad about his relationship with the Lord, his dad finally looked at him and said, son, what you don't know is, is that when I was your age, I did the same thing. And, um, you know, I got over it. Wow. Now here we are, 
30 years later, and my friend still walks with the Lord, and my friend would have concern over the fact that his dad seemed to not be moved and said, you'll get over it. True Christianity and true conversion never gets over being redeemed by the Savior of the world. Now, let me tell you that it's a natural and a good response. If, if, you see, if somebody would say, well, I, wow, I'm not sure if I'm continuing to trust in him. I'm not sure if I'm continuing with him. Uh, I, how, do I, how do I know? And it, 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 you don't understand. Sometimes I'm really pulled away. Well, and, and let me tell you that if you're concerned about that, that's a good sign. But if you're not concerned about that, that's a bad sign. If your attitude is, oh, I'm good, you know, that, no way, not me. I would never, never leave the Lord. You got to be kidding me. Um, you got no. See, the Scripture tells us, if any man thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. Friends, I have often thought that I will be the next one to leave the faith if I am not very, very careful to stay in the truth. My heart could be deceived. My mind could be deceived. I could be pulled away with the love of this world as opposed to the love of Christ if I did not continue to look to Christ and trust in Him. Even so, my salvation is not my means um, of continuance. It is the gift of God. I want you to see number five. And this is where we pull together Reformation and gospel truth in this. You see, the Roman church left the true gospel. That's what happened there in the third and fourth centuries. The Roman church left the true gospel and invented another gospel of popes and power and divergent doctrines. You merit, mankind is good at doing that. They accused the reformers of innovation. You see, when the reformers came along a thousand years later, the reformers were saying, well, wait a minute, let's get back to the book. It's only Jesus. It's not everything else. It's really just the Word, and it's just Jesus. It's not all of these other popes and princes and powers and indulgences and everything else. And they said, you're inventing new doctrine. And the reformers said, no, you forgot the old doctrine. Now, this is very important for Christians to recognize because if we don't recognize it, we'll do the same thing will wind up being carried away into other beliefs. You see, they accuse the reformers of innovation when in all reality the reformers sought reclamation of the gospel that had been lost. That is an important aspect of Christian history that we need to hold on to. You see, Christians today, like the reformers, must constantly seek to reform back to the true gospel, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. In verse 23, it says, you, you, re, you stay and you continue in the gospel that has been proclaimed everywhere in all time. Jude says the, the gospel that has been declared once and for all to the saints. So Christians, we are called to continually remember back to the gospel. New theologies are extremely dangerous. New things that you've never heard and thought about that seem to be getting, getting traction with various groups and movements should be very, very carefully weighed against the Scripture. You need to be aware and careful to not go after things that are new. What we need to do is to get back to the things that have been proclaimed from of old. Well, what do we do with this? There are some key questions and application for you. Number one is this. If as I've been preaching and you hear that Jesus has died for your sins, the question is this. Do you sense that you need to repent of your sin and receive Christ? Do you sense that you need to repent of your sin and receive Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 1, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Have you received Christ? Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. 
You see, the way we become a Christian is to turn away from our sin and turn to Christ. We turn away from ourself, trusting in ourselves, and we turn to Christ. And so right now, in this place, at this moment, as you hear these words, I call upon you to turn from sin and self and to turn to Christ in belief. That's what it means to become a Christian. And maybe today, you need to do that once and for all and say, no longer I, but Christ. Number two is this. If you have done that, are you continuing with Christ in faith that is stable and steadfast? Are you continuing with Christ? You see, because that is a key question for us. And if you're, again, I would say, if you would say, I'm not sure I'm continuing with him. I mean, I look good and I'm here this morning, but if people really knew what was going on with me, they would know that I'm kind of being a fraud right now, and my wife and I are really struggling, or my husband and I are, you know, this is happening, or that is it. People don't know what I did this week, or they don't know how long it's been since I've spent any time with the Lord. You don't know how far my heart really is from God. I'm, I'm here because I kind of know I need to be here, or there's some, there's some pressures on my life. Life, but I'm really not where I need to be. And I, I would say, are you continuing with Christ in a stable and faithful way? And if you're alarmed by where your heart is, I'm going to say, don't silence the alarm. Listen to the alarm and say, Lord, help me. Help me, because verse 23 indicates that some shift away from hope in the gospel. Do you see that in verse 23 at the top? You see the the opposite. Are you continuing in the faith, stable, stable and steadfast? And look at the next part. Not shifting from the hope of the gospel. That's what some do. They shift from hope in the gospel. Are you shifting away from the gospel of Christ? For hope or interest in other things, I'm going to say to you, a Christian will run back to the gospel. May you run back to the Savior who died for you. May you return not to leave. That is one of the proofs that you're a Christian. Let's pray together.